Oh yeah, so I have to tick the. There we go. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. Yes, yeah, so this is the landscape around me and these are the plants. So you can see the materials that people have to work with. You know, there's certain type of materials. Um, next. Um, so I've been, uh, first of all, I learned to make rope, which is one traditional skill about 30 years ago. I learned to make heather rope, first of all, and was using the normal materials that people used to work with. Next. And then I did a project um, called Entwined Suanta, where I made 100 ropes, a, a rope a day for over a period of three months or so. And over this time, I then explored different materials. Um, so there was all plants close to my house, um, but I did lots of materials that were uh, worked with rope, but I explored other ones as well. And it meant that I got to know more intimately, you know, some you can really push and handle, others you need to handle much more delicately. Next. So purple moorgrass is one of the materials that was used quite a lot. And this is it on the left. It forms, uh, it can smother the other uh, plants around it. So there's a lot of it. It's Britain's only deciduous grass. So it sheds its leaves in the winter and it's the white um leaves which lie on the heather and get caught in the uh wire fencing when there's wind and on the right is looping piece made out of single strands of the grass so next looping is one of the very early techniques that people used to use so this shawl is is made out of very the simple looping stitch and twining the stone, the wrap stone on the left next is also twining. So it's these basic techniques that I've been exploring and working with. So this is twined with uh, purple moor grass uh, made rope uh, for the horizontal element and the vertical element is birch. And twining allows you to, you, you can't bend birch that much, but then you can make a, a structure which in itself can bend. Next. So that was part of um, an exploration. So there was an ar archeological site on Sky High Pasture Cave, which people probably know a bit about. And there was um, excavations there over a period of eight years and they discovered an Iron Age body of a woman which closed the uh, site off and she had two children with her and there was this big ceremonial burial. And the archeologist nicknamed her Bridget. She was a local woman that they they found out through dental calculus, and but the, there is a local site, Kilbride, as well. And so I made three mantles for Bridget using um, plants that were associated with her, thinking of her needing protection and shelter again. Next. So another way that I work or get or research is often through um, texts or conversations or little snippets of things in books which then hint at something. So Carmina Gadelica is a good source. It's just giving you little hints of different relationships with the landscape and with particular plants which might have been used for different things. Next. So this um, project I got funding from Creative Scotland for and I've been working with Dr. Karen Hardy, who specializes in the Paleolithic. So the Paleolithic period is anything older than 10 or 11,000 years ago. So, but it goes to actually 2 million years, I think. So it's a long, long period and it's before Homo sapiens. In fact, um, one of the, ver well, yes, I've got that later on next. So one of this, part of this project is so researching in various different ways. Um, so my expertise and knowledge is in this more recent history and the kind of materials that people used to use here. So this is an example of, of some heather rope that I found on an old house. And, you know, this is a quote from the history of Skye. So people weren't even allowed to gather the heather that they needed. Rushes were used quite often for thatching because they, people couldn't find, couldn't get the good quality materials. Next. So this is purple moor grass again. Um, there's lots of it around. It's very easy to gather, but it's not very strong. 
and yet I've come across these quotes um, and I, Grishnish is actually quite close to where I stay and the fact in 1770 fishermen were using this for making their fishing nets has intrigued me. I know I can trust the the source of the, that it was that plant because he Thomas Pennant traveled with a botanist. Uh, but I don't know how they treated it. I don't know how thin they made the rope and maybe they plied it again. Uh, yes. So there's lots of, of details you don't know. But then I come across another quote, which then supports it um, from in Orkney, then Shetland, the, the fish, fishermen were using these, the same plant. Next. So these little snippets of things kind of, you know, I, I find things over the years and then pull them together. So... A long time ago, so 40,000 years ago, this is from a mammoth bone, and they reckon it was for making three ply rope. Um, so this is before Homo sapiens. And on the right, you've got a, a microscopic image of um, three, the oldest rope that's been found. And this was in, in 2020 in France in the cave, and it was on the underside of a, a stone tool. And they reckon that it's three ply rope with maybe twisted pine or juniper fibers. And what's interesting is that because the consciousness has been raised about string technology and the importance, people are now beginning to find different things and, and notice things which they maybe in the past wouldn't have done. Next. So part of this project, I've made a few replicas of things as a sort of way of getting into finding out so this is the Lascaux rope, which is 17,000 years old. Um, it was found in Lascaux caves in the wall leading between two or two caves. And they made a plaster cast of it. There were five sections, um, but they now have the plaster cast. The actual rope has decayed and they couldn't find what material it was made of. I've made this out of lime bark which was used traditionally for a lot of different things. And it was really interesting making this. I had to remake it to get it the exact right size because um, it's three ply. And it just it feels really strong and, and nice in your hand. Next. So another rope um, from 5,000 years ago, there was crowberry rope um, found in the Scarabray excavations. And this is in the, new, the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. And again, it's getting the right thickness and just seeing, we don't know what that was used for or, or anything. So, but there was lots, probably still used for, uh, in Orkney for those very fine baskets. It's a lovely material. Next. So I've made a series of uh, 25 artifacts. Um, so some, some of them, they're using the traditional skills, but I've also got um, rope that I found on the shore uh, because that's just part of and, and looped it or just wind it and there's um, a bit of nettle um, looping there so there's a bit of looping a little bit of weaving with flax and some twining and some ropes next so another quote that um, has intrigued me and I keep thinking about because just this one phrase until about 1840 all sacks for holding grain were made locally from sedges or from straw this is on sky so 1840 isn't that long ago and i'm thinking all the sacks for holding grain and you know that's masses of work how how where did all these materials come from who made them when were they gathered how long did the sacks last um so on the left is a picture of uh, Shetland Kishi, which is a small bag made out of soft materials. And you need 40 meters of rope before you start making it, which is what I'm making here on the right. That's nearly 40, it's about 30 something at the moment of rush rope, which I'll then make into a bag, into a sack. The middle picture is a sack from the Monarch Isles, and that's made out of marum and they were waterproof. And that used to, there was a crane that um, they took the grain to the to North Uist to go to the mill. Next. So this is me trying to pull together uh, a few different, uh, there's so many different materials we use for so many different things. 
um, in different places. Um, so nettle for Viking sails, bog pine for highland ploughs, hair moss for Roman road building, straw for Irish corn granaries, heather for seaweed gathering, Western Isles, rush for Orkney Kishi, willow bass for hobbling cattle, horsehair for fowling St Kilda, purple moorgrass for fishing nets sky, marum for island chair seats. Next. So that gives you a sort of picture. It's like a, yeah, people really understood the plants and what was around them. So one thing that I've through this learnt about through this project is people a long time ago made very fine threads, really thin, and they used they had a lot of nets really old early on. This is the thinnest I've been able to make, and it's from lime bass. Lime bass is really nice material. It's very strong, and you can split it very evenly. Next. So this is the Antrea net, which is 10,000 years old, and it was found totally complete in clay in what, what used to be um, Finland, but it's now part of Russia. Um, but it's in the museum in Helsinki, and that's it on the right embedded in the clay. It's made out of lime uh, willow bast, and the knots that were used in it are the same knots that are used for fishing uh, fishing nets now. Um, it was 30 metres long by about one and a half deep, and it had the floats on the top made from pine bark and the, the stone sinkers as well on the bottom. So there's something about it being totally complete, which is really intriguing and quite fine um, uh, mesh net. Uh, next. So this is another net. Um, this is from North Uist. This was used for in burns in the dam stream and then put this in and, and catch the fish within it. And this was supposedly made out of the roots of sedge, which I've read are very long and I presume strong. Um, it's just you don't really find that much of those materials. So maybe there was lots more of these things. I don't know. So inspired by these nets next, I've been making a series of seven nets which will form one large uh, circle on the floor as an installation in the gallery and the seven sections each section is a different material and a different technique so the one on the left there is lime bast with a traditional net knot the one on the right is dandelion obviously that wasn't used i don't think but it's just a nice material to work with and it's a different type of knot next uh, this is soft rush, but I've um, split it so it's really fine and I've made quite fine string. And the one on the left is twined and the one on the right is sim very simple looping. Next. And this is nettle. So nettle is also a new material for me. And this really, you can make lovely strong string. And this is looping, but looping with a twist and it just gives it a different feel. Next. So that's the looping with a twist. Next. And that's a bit of a bit of a, a sense of what they're all going to look like together. Next. So there's actually within string making, there's quite a lot of different technologies. Um, so there's uh, what I've been talking mostly about is handmade string, which is what I was taught. Um, so certain materials mean you can only work with them in a certain way, like heather or rush. Um, you can't. So some materials you can roll on your leg or your or, or between your hands. But most of the materials on Sky, you can't do that with. So the way I've learned is just the twisting by hand. The other method that people use, which is the top middle one, there's bundles of them there is where you work with two people and there's a so you're working in the rhythm and it's a bit like spinning but it's with a larger amount of material and then you need to leap you need to keep it in tension otherwise it'll unravel at the bottom with my hand there that's also plying ropes so that's the whole thing about how ropes can be plied together and spinning so on the top right um so that's flax that i've grown 
and then um, I didn't ret it. I just left it and it was damp enough here. It seemed to work. And then I bashed it and got rid of all the all the outer bark. And then I've spun that with a spindle. And then that's nettle fibers next. So spinning is a huge technology, uh, which I've not really I've, I've been I've spun and I've spun with a spinning wheel and a spindle, but I haven't. And I often see them in museums and it's the things that you spindle worlds is the things that you find. But this is flax that this I normally I have spun with wool and this is what a wool spindle. And this is flax, which again, I've grown and and tri and processed. But when I was spinning, I just felt the spindle wasn't the right weight. It wasn't quite right. It needed to be slightly heavier or something. So next. So I then realize, you know, it's kind of, it's quite obvious, but there is so much technology to understand within the simple thing of a spindle and a spindle whirl. And I think people were doing this constantly, and that's how you could get the really fine threads if you've got the, the material right and, and your spindle. Um, so on the left is six spindle whirls from High Pasture Cave, which is the site I mentioned uh, up above. And on the right is two spindle whirls from the archive center in Portree. Next. Um, so these are ropes, uh, again, they were, together in a house and it's the same material but it's two different methods of making so the ones on the right is the method I've been talking about where it's one person and you're twisting and kind of locking over each other and the one on the right is when you work oh run on the left sorry when you work with somebody else with what's called a thraw cook and one person is is twisting and feeding back next and the other person is with the pile of materials and <laughs> got a rhythm and you've got to understand the, the tension so this is basically what I'm thinking is that when you're looking at archaeological evidence or you're looking at little snippets of research the people is normally what's missing and it's actual physical making and physical doing and that interaction is, is missing and that's a really important part of it and um, so if you were plying ropes you'd have several people plying them and things next so part of this project, um, we had uh, I've had a couple of string cayleys where people were making and sharing stories. And that's how um, Susanna and Tuya got involved because they came as a specialist on each one of these. And we had music as well. And on the top left is some very low key installations, um, rope installations that I've been working with uh, this is a Viewfield Garden Collective. So there's a, a community project and just working slowly with people and, and getting them involved. Next. So that's one of the installations. So um, there is a blog if you want to look, there's a few things up there. It's more like a sketchbook of the some a few different aspects of the project and my website. And I also wanted to mention if you want to if you've got any string stories or you want to get in touch with me, that would be great. And I'll pass over to Susanna now. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. I'm just going to make sure there's nobody else wanting to come in. Oh, I was just going to say, um, if people have got questions, if you want to put them in the chat box, that would be great because we're going to have time at the end. Um, and then we, Catherine is going to... Um, read them out and we'll 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 sort that out so if things appear, uh, come to you just write them in the chat box that's great thanks that's great thank you I'll just go back and um, pop the slides back up for the next section Are you able to are you able to see that? Yeah. Yes. Can you enlarge it to fill the screen, please? Yeah. 
there we go. Hello everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here and thank you Caroline for um, talking about your very interesting project. I'm an archaeologist so I come from things from a different direction and spend my time working with the ancient evidence. Um, next please. When I tell people that I'm a textile archaeologist, which is uh, often how I describe myself, people will say things like, well, is there anything left? Because of course we all know that organic materials readily decay if we leave them outside or in the ground or exposed to the elements. And so what this first table is, is looking at some of the ways that organic material um, might be preserved. And this is due to chemical and physical factors. So first of all, we have organic preservation where the surrounding matrix, by that we mean the soil material, might have a certain chemistry to it that um, in very special circumstances allows preservation. So slightly acid or alkali conditions will be beneficial to the preservation of um, wool or plant fibers. Preservation in salt, uh, like pickling things, um, will help preserve organic materials in certain circumstances, as well as this unusual preservation condition called mineral preservation, where um, organic materials might be preserved in the corrosion products of iron or copper, and you know, very unusual circumstances such as crude oil, which you find in other parts of the world. It's also the effect of climate. Um, if things are wet or waterlogged, lacking air, then the microbes won't um, be there to, to allow them to decay. Uh, Caroline mentioned the Antria fishing net, and that was found in waterlogged clay, and that's why that was preserved for such a very long time. Things might be dry or frozen, um, or in very special microclimates like caves or under the debris of a volcano, such as Pompeii again, creating these, these unusual physical and chemical um, contexts of preservation. There's also uh, preservation by transformation. Maybe organic materials have been carbonized, so turning into a different material, or been left as imprints um, in other materials. And so these are some of the ways that we can try and investigate the topic of string, cord, textiles, which is what we're talking about today. Next please. So what I want to do is look at some of the early archaeological evidence for string in Scotland. I'm going to sneak down to England as well because there's some really nice evidence at Moss Farm I want to talk about but as this is the Highland Festival and the project with Carolina I want to look at some of the early evidence in Scotland. I want us to start up in the very north, at the Ness of Brogga. Um, and this is a, uh, this is a complex um, monumental structure site dated to the Neolithic, so 3000 BCE, so about 5000 years ago. And it's had some remarkable finds. Um, and one of the observations that was made by um, you know, people working on the digs were some impressions on the ceramics. So this is the type of transformation I was talking about. And if we look at the image on the left, you'll see an impression of a beautifully made piece of string. And so this um, is lovely early, uh, early evidence of an impression of string, a two ply, um, ply yarn there. You can see that the twist is preserved in a in an S direction, but it would have been Z because it's a, an impression. And that's around four centimeters long and um, the, at the maximum three millimeters in diameter. If you look at the right, the ceramic that someone's holding in their hand, you can see the, the curved impressions on that ceramic. And looking at this uh, carefully with my colleague, Emma Smith, and with the help of Jan uh, from the site, who's been doing imaging on these finds, what we can see is this is an impression of some basketry. So while not, um, not uh, slightly, while still working from fibers, a different technology from the string. Here 
these are not the twisted uh, string, uh, plied strings, but using strands of fiber um, in the sort of uh, materials maybe that Caroline was talking about. Because they're impressions, we don't understand the material that they're coming from. But what we, what we can understand is that these uh, are most likely plant fibers because of the smooth profile in the frame. Can I just ask people to mute their microphones, please? Yeah. Oh, I'll come out for a second, bear with me. Or if you could mute everyone, I'll unmute myself. Yeah. Um. The next, please. So the impression that we've just looked at, the basketry impression, the type of material this is, is a coiled basket. And there are a number of these impressions of Vanessa Brogger. And these are just some examples of coiled basketry to give you an idea of the materiality of that form. Um, these uh, lovely uh, structures. Circular, they would have been circular. The impressions on those uh, ceramics are circular. So this is from the Neolithic, we're talking around 5,000 years ago there. Next, please. We move forward a little bit in time and come to another um, really fascinating uh, line of evidence of string. During the, um, the very earliest Bronze Age, or what might also be called the Chalcolithic, the Copper Age, it's very early metal using periods, um, there's a change in the ceramics and they have these fascinating uh, beaker shaped vessel, vessels that get called beakers. And they're decorated with a number of different types of materials. Um, and one of those materials that are used to impress on the vessels is string, which is, oh, next please. And there's a little insert here. So once again, we start to see string taking center stage um, in uh, impressions, but here deliberately placed on the vessels have these uh, finer, finer string vessels. And these come from Kilmartin, they're, they're grave assemblages from uh, Kilmartin Glen, where there are a number of um, uh, Bronze Age and monumental structures. Next, please. And the next one as well. There's an insert. So the oh no, not the next one. Go back. Yeah, there we go. Just so we can see the insert. So this is another example of one of those um, decorated beaker vessels. And here we can see you know, just a huge amount of string here being used and pressed on the vessel. And it's really fascinating to think why this might have been the case um, and what significant string had, whether it was to create simply to create a texture, a pattern, or you know why string was chosen really as the decorative medium for these vessels. Next please. So there's a question um, of what materials were being used. I think Caroline's work really points to the huge diversity of plants that could have been used in the Scottish landscape. Um, one of the interesting areas that, well, one of the areas that archaeologists have been interested in is the use of bast fibres, which are the fibres that come from the inside of plant stems of certain, um, certain plants. And the, the diagram on the left is showing you at the point of D, the position of fibre bundles just underneath the epidermis. There are various plants that have bast fibres, and these range from tree bast fibres, so the elm and lime I'm showing you here. It's also plants like nettle and flax. These are all bast plants and the, the fibres need to be extracted in this way. But this, these aren't the only fibres that could have been used, but they're particularly interesting because uh, flax um, is a domestic plant that can be grown and is, is therefore part of um, the development of technologies as people move from gathering to farming. Next, please. So when we think about string, um, you can think about this in all different uh, scales. For me, um, 
a string is a, a technology of, of twisting together fibers in various in various ways uh, to form these long continuous strands. And the scale I work at might be string and cord, and then we might move into threads and yarns, sometimes very fine threads and yarns used for textiles. But that technology of how they're made is also really fascinating. And uh, Caroline talked about the, some of the technologies of making string. And one of the things I've been really fascinated with is trying to understand those technologies for textiles, because it seems quite likely that this technology of uh, what um, I, with my colleagues, we're calling splicing yarns, these working yarns without a, a spindle, with adding in uh, the fibres, this is for plant fibres, adding in fibres in a splicing uh, uh, motion and therefore technology is something that seems to occur very early on in the use of um, finer, uh, fine yarns for textiles. And this is um, something really fascinating for me. So if we move on to the next slide, please. So I've mentioned um, that I'm a textile archaeologist and I've started to bring in this idea of textiles and yarns. Um, and this technology that Caroline's introduced and now I'm following on the technology of string, I think it's just so important to humanity. And we're just so uh, used to uh, being surrounded by it, really. Not only do we have the string, but these fine yarns used in textiles. Um, we're really surrounded by that, and um, since it's been developed, it's just carried on continuously to the present day. But when we think about textiles, these are then um, a web of interlaced threads produced on a loom. So they're really based in this technology of, of uh, fibres and twisting. But there are many objects that don't fall in, into the precise definition of being worked on the loom. But there are and there are several classes of fibre artifact that derive from related but separate technologies. So here we're seeing this intersection of the, the string, the yarn, with the fibres, weaving, all sorts of different construction technologies. I'd like to now talk about um, textiles in the Bronze Age. Uh, next, please. And starting with these. Uh, textiles in Scotland. In Scotland, there are a number of, uh, well, number, a handful, <laughs> should I say, of sites with preserved textiles from the Bronze Age. What's really fascinating is there are the plant fiber textiles as well as sheep's wool textiles in the late Bronze Age. So there's a diversity you can see there. And I've put some examples here. There's a hoard called St Andrew's Hoard, and a hoard is a is a deposit of often metal items buried in the ground. So there's the metal item, items buried at St Andrews and that metal preservation here is important. So in the Bronze Age, we have metal items and these are preserved because of the, um, the, the changes in the, the, the chemistry of the textiles in contact with metals. Um, the two spearheads that I'm showing you here, one comes from Carnoustie, the other from Pyot Dykes, and they both also have preserved textiles. The Carnoustie spearhead has wool preserved textiles, sorry, wool textiles preserved on it, and the Pyot Dykes has um, uh, plant fiber textiles, and these are sort of a bung inside the, um, inside the uh, butt of the spear. So we can start to understand the, this uh, technology of, of weaving in the Bronze Age. And this was surely a very important material at that time. One of the um, exciting uh, developments in understanding textiles and yarns in the Bronze Age is must up the farm pile dwelling settlement. And here is, I'm going to take us down to England because I think there's some interesting things to understand about fiber here. Have the next slide, please. So Must Farm is what we call a pile dwelling settlement. It's found in Cambridgeshire and it's dated to the, the same time period as those finds I just showed you um, in Scotland. And what we're seeing here is a plan of part of that settlement with these uh, round houses. Uh, next, please. 
which would have looked something like this as a reconstruction. They were built on a waterway and there was a big fire and the, the houses caught fire and fell down. So next, please. And so what happened is those textiles became partially uh, charred. So first of all, transformed by the fire and then waterlogged in that wet deposit, which is where they stayed until they were excavated. So that's the preservation of the Must Farm uh, fabrics in brief. Next, please. This is one of the, um, just to show you one of those collapsed uh, structures with the, with the roof shown in yellow there in the diagram. It's collapsed on top of the, the uprights. Next, please. And there are many different finds, the sort of things you'd expect on an archaeological site, the inorganic materials, the ceramics, the metals, but also these wonderful organic materials, which I'll talk a little bit about now. Next, please. So there are five different categories of artifacts, which, which has uh, many of these are completely unique to Must Farm, and they help us understand the process of treating uh, fibres to make yarn um, and then textiles. So there are fibres, there are plant materials that are processed into fibre, there are preserved yarns, um, so these yarns and cord, cord, cords, including these uh, ones that are wound onto sticks or into balls. There's fabrics uh, made by weaving the textiles, there's fabrics made by twining, and also knotted nets. Next, please. Of these, the, the flax, uh, the bundles uh, of fibre processed, the yarns and the textiles are all made of flax. And this is work uh, of identifying the plant species carried out by my colleague Marguerite Gleber, looking at the microscopy of the, the plant cells to try and understand the species. And this is the identification that has been made. Next, please. So these uh, flax plants would have been grown um, somewhere potentially in, in the vicinity um, and then harvested and processed. So if you remember me saying that these are, are bast fibres, the fibres are found underneath the stem and they need extracting. And must farm the plant, the flax plants were harvested and the strips of fibre were removed from those stems and they were worked into sort of uh, aligned bundles on the left, you could see some of these, and those those sort of bunches like um, like ponytails were then wrapped together, possibly round a hand, to create these bundles. And these are stores of fibre. They're not yarn at this point. They're the store of raw material, the fibre, and they're very carefully kept in these wonderful um, fibre bundles. Next, please. And one of the things that I was looking at with my colleague Marguerite Glabel when we were examining this was understanding how those yarns were made. So they're being processed from these bundles of fibre, there are those strips of fibre. And by looking very carefully at the yarn, we're suggesting that these were produced by a technique of splicing, possibly more akin to the making of cord than the draft spinning that would have been used for working wool textiles. And that's by looking at small features on those, uh, those yarns. So this technology relates the must farm uh, textile fibers uh, and, uh, and, and yarns to the string technology. Next, please. These are some examples of the, the yarns, uh, little balls and twisted, uh, sorry, balls and um, the, what we might call bob, bobbins or maybe shuttles used for weaving. I just thought you might like to see the diversity there. They're really fascinating. Um, and the yarns range from around, um, they're absolutely, uh, they're so incredibly fine. If you look at the, the second from the right, there are sort of two sausages, sausage shapes together. These have the very finest yarn of just 
one five millimeter so a tenth of a millimeter in diameter it's just remarkably fine it looks a bit like a hair it's really hard to see it's been wrapped up in a textile there so people were looking after this very incredibly fine yarn others are more standard diameters of you know around it you know 0.2 to half a millimeter in diameter so there's some remarkable yarns in this technology next please this is one of the textiles or the next one as well because it has an insight uh, in, insert yes so that's showing you some of the measurements so this is one of the textiles shown um, at a larger scale including some of these beautifully made yarns that we think are made by splicing from flax and I think this is really remarkable to see this wonderful achievement of this technology, making these incredible fine yarns and then weaving them into textiles at thread counts of 14 to 29 threads per centimetre from those textiles, which is something, you know, really quite remarkable to, to think people are doing this by hand. Next, please. But I want to take us back to the string again. I'm coming to the close now. So we've looked at the textiles, but the string remains important for making fabrics or these uh, twisted fibers. And there's also twine fabrics at Must Farm and, and indeed at sites in Scotland of, of similar periods. And these twine fabrics uh, work in a slightly different way. Caroline already gave us an introduction to them. So they're different from weaving. And they show this continuity of these um, these uh, the string and, and fabric technologies um, with very interesting constructions at Mass Farm, including sort of tufts and piles as, as seen on the right. Um, so uh, now bringing this to a close, I think um, it's been fascinating to join Caroline and colleagues on the String Lines project and really think about the significance of, of string technologies and just how foundational these developments were for not just the early periods, but you know, continuously over, over the whole multitudes of time of humanity. So thank you very much. So thank you so much. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to put the screen up for you. Is that it? Um, and we'll keep on waiting. So, my name is Tuja Kirkinen, and I work at the University of Helsinki as a postdoctoral researcher. I'm specialized in animal hairs and fibers, and I'm also a weaver. So, textiles and fibers are very important and important for me. Uh, as Susanna told us about the circumstances in which textiles can be served, we realized that uh, most of the material has uh, disappeared and decomposed during the time. In my part, I study soil samples collected from archaeological sites uh, in which no organic remains have, or, or in which no organic remains can be seen by naked eye. Instead, my, my aim is to detect microscopic remains of highly degraded organic materials, such as clothes, fibers, and feathers. I am currently working with Mesolithic burials from Northern Europe and trying to figure out what kind of soft materials were placed in the graves. Next, please. But there was one missing. Okay, so I have <laughs> lost one, one slide. Uh, I have two uh, case studies by which I try to give you an impression what I'm doing. The first one is from Mayosua in Eastern Finland, and the second one will be from the Isle of Skye in, in Scotland. And uh, so the map is now behind the, actually in my view, the map cannot be seen, but 
uh, the site is in the eastern Finland, and it was excavated in 2018. It was a Mesolithic red ochre grave, which you can see between the standing, standing persons that the red uh, feature on the, on the ground. During the excavation, almost all soil was collected for different analyses, such as lipids, chemical analyses, and fiber research. Next, please. So uh, the only finds from, from this grave were uh, four teeth enamels. And on the basis, basis of these, we know that the buried person was a child who was about three to 10 years old. And besides the teeth, there were eight watch objects, two transfer arrowheads, two retouts, artifacts, and flakes. Uh, in Finland, the soils are acidic, which is disastrous for bones and plant fibers, for example. And that's why there are no, no bones other than the teeth and no organic finds. I suppose that the situation is quite the same in many parts of, of Highland area. The grave was dated to the Mesolithic time uh, on, the basis, on the basis of shore displacement and the uh, of, and the way and, and these transfer arrowheads. So there was no material for uh, radiocarbon dating. Next, please. So here is a picture of, of these, one of these samples. I got 60 samples of which I analyzed 23 samples. Partly. And the procedure to analyze these soil samples is, is in short that I wash the samples in the sieve so that I can remove the red pigment from the sample because the red pigment colors the whole, whole sample and, and, and prevents the seeing of uh, anything. And that's why it has to be removed. And then I pipette the material on microscope slides and cover them with cover slips and, and analyze them with microscope. And the microparticles uh, which I found, I identify them uh, with the aid of reference collection and publications. Next, please. Um, these are now mixed somehow. Can you go back? Okay, this is the one missing. Oh, geez, I think. Yeah, okay, next one. So the results, uh, I found mammal hairs. Uh, about 24, and most of them couldn't be identified. They were too degraded. I identified, identified uh, hairs of small rodents, which are most probably secondary by nature. However, they were found only in samples taken from the grave area, not in the samples taken, taken outside of the grave. And it has also to be remembered that the European mowers were traded still in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, some hairs were identified as uh, canidae or carnivore hairs. Most prob probably they were all from the same animal. And it might be 
interpret it as a buried dog. It's where the dogs were buried in, in Mesolithic graves in, in Northern Europe. Or then there might be a foodware made of wolf skin or dog skin. Next, please. Oh, now these are mixed. Could you please go down? Down, down, down. Oh, there are quite, quite many slides which are missing now. So, uh, can you take the slides? Yeah, apologies. I think um, I've got the wrong version up. Do you have it on your screen and you can share, or are you happy to wait and I'll get the one you sent me? I, I think maybe I um, take the next slide. Okay, yeah, I will. And, and I just talk, talk the results. Two seconds. I'll just yeah. load it for you. Apologies about this. I'm having. No, no problem. Of, um, let me just get into that email for you. Yeah, in the meantime, um, besides animal hairs, I found also very small fragments of bird feathers. And they ori originated mostly from the downy parts of the feathers, so it's possible that there was a third down in, in the grave. And one possible explanation is then that the child was uh, laid to rest in uh, some kind of pet or feathers. Part of these uh, feathers were um, identified as a waterfall. And, uh, and one uh, bird feather was identified as a, as a bird which belongs to the family of falcons. And the falcon bubble would have been used in fletching the tra transverse quartz arrowheads found in the grave. Yeah, go down, 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 and one, yeah. And then find a, yeah, that's good, excellent. And then I found also vast fibers, only three microscopic vast fibers from one sample in, in that grave. And possible species in the Mesolithic context are nettle, and three busts such as willow, lime, and oak. And as you have already heard, um, these plant fibers might have been used for ropes, strings, and nets. Next, please. And here is an artistic view about of the child who was buried in in Mayonsuo. In this picture made by Tom Björkund, uh, he or she is uh, resting at a dwelling, and he, his or her arrow heads are, or arrows are beside him or her, and the dogs are sleeping, sleeping with her. And in this version, uh, there is no bed made of. Uh, downy feathers, but, uh, but the child is dressed in an anorak made of bird skins, which we knew were used, used during the historic time in, in Finland too. Next, please. And here is the uh, second case study. It's from the Isle of Skye, from a um, from a site that has been in use during the Paleolithic and Mesolithic Stone Age. And the site has been excavated by archaeologist Karen Hardy. This soil analysis is in preparation, uh, but uh, I will show you the first results, which I think are 
Oh, amazing. Next, please. So in this site, which is thousands of years old, uh, complete hairs were found in, in soil samples. And, and they were extremely well preserved. And this is mostly because the soil in the site is very acidic. So it, it preserves, it has preserved animal fibers. And these were identified so that they were hairs from Ovide. And because it's, uh, it's Paleolithic or Mesolithic, these cannot be uh, domestic cattle, but they must be aurochs. They were also Canidae hairs, uh, most probably of wolf hairs. And then there were carnivora hairs, which might be many bear hairs, maybe from wild cats. And these will be studied further to get uh, precise identifications. Here, I want to thank Highland Wildlife Park and uh, Killingham Wild Cattle for Scottish Wildcat and Cattle reference samples. Next, please. So thank you very much for, for the opportunity of being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Apologies for the glitches there. I was having some kind of Zoom gremlins that wouldn't let me do too many things at once. Um, there, there is some um, questions in the chat box. Um, if you are up for some questions, Caroline, to it and Susanna. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I, I saw the first one. If you want to read that out about 1530 in Unst. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's Le Leslie, if you're there, feel free to unmute yourself and ask if you'd like. Hi, uh, I'm researching Unst in 1530 and um, I've really been sort of trying to research fibres that would be used for weaving baskets, cloth. Um, I'm aware that, you know, there would be wadmal for clothing, but for fishing as well. So if you've got any ideas, I kind of thought about Heather. Yeah, well, Heather was would have definitely been used, but I think lots of the sedges and grasses would have been used as well. Um, and the roots as well as the um, stems. Um, unst, I mean, possibly uh, is the peat there. The, yeah, so some when they found um, the bog fir, that was a great source of, you know, the, the pine trees that are embedded and um, they used to um, split that. And then I've, I've got a quote, actually, a couple of quotes. But um, so that was called uh, for was. Yeah. So they made ropes out of that. And that was really strong. And that was for boats and it floated. And it was also for pulling the plow and things like that. So it was it, that that uh, was a good source. Um, they probably had leather and things as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, crowberry. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe seaweed for different things. Yeah, uh, I mean, I've really been sort of trying to think of lots of things. Um, and I would mean, have I... been, they would have been growing stuff. So they, they've got oats, um, which is lovely to work with. And f do you think they would have had flax, Susanna? Yeah. Yes. Definitely yeah. By that point, sure. Hemp. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there was another question um, from Carrie. If you're there, Carrie, um, you can unmute yourself, or I can ask for you. It's up to yourself.
No, she's too noisy. Okay, so she says, do we have an educated guess as to when wool first began um, began use in Britain? I'm aware of both linguistic and archaeological evidence relating to wool production in Uruk. So I make sure I don't know my pronunciations right there, but I'm not aware of anything related to Britain. The, the wool that I showed you from um, St Andrew's Hoard and told you about from Carnoustie is some of the earliest preserved wool. Um, in fact, I think it is the earliest preserved wool that I know of in Britain, I say hesitantly. Um, and, but I'm sure that wool was around earlier than that. It's really difficult to tell. There was wool around um, 1400 BC in Scandinavia and in earlier points in you know, northern France um, and similar time to Scandinavia and the Netherlands. But Britain is just really tricky because the, these early preserved walls are, uh, are not as early as we think. Um, but it, it's also due to preservation because um, we can't be sure if there weren't walls it's a bit earlier, if not, say, 500 years earlier, a bit like Scandinavia and the Netherlands. One would sort of expect it to be a similar uh, point in time is that so it's a really good question and the answer is a little bit tricky for that one mm. thank you um there's a question here from Catherine max if you want to ask if you're still here hi yes i am um i was one maybe outside your particular area interest or expertise. However, I was wondering if anybody had any insight as to who developed and practiced these various techniques. It's something that's very easy to make assumptions about. Um, you may have some things to say. Thank you. Um, I've talked about it quite a lot with um, Karen Hardy because um, she thinks that lots of the fine thread was women's work and children's actually even from really young sort of three their kids would have been making rope um and thread and because you the fingers would have been more nimble but lots of the stuff i've read um about the other ropes men were making those ropes like men made the heather ropes all winter and uh other other ropes and things um so i i think it varies uh and Sometimes I think also that, you know, maybe some people would develop a certain skill and and make 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 rope um, to, you know, could could really make rope fast and quick and really strong and with a certain material. And then other people could work with it with a different material. But I know with this project, it has been mostly women that have been interested. I mean, I always want to have more men involved, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know if the other two have got something to add. Suja? No, um, I think I think it's it's a great question and it's so hard to answer. Um, in terms of the uh, Neolithic and Bronze Ages in Britain, it's it's a I think Caroline's answer is as good as <laughs> any. But in other parts of the world and other parts of Europe, um, there are clues as to who was um, associated with making yarn. Um, and this is through finding things like spindle walls or other weaving equipment in graves and in graves where there's skeletal material and that can be identified as either uh, male or female or sometimes can't be identified. Um, and so in some places, there's an association of women with those tools. So it could be that both men and women were making yarn uh, with the spindle walls, but that women become particularly associated with it. Or I think it's very likely for bronze and iron ages in, 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 uh, around the Mediterranean, for sure, women were highly associated with making yarn in those periods, yarn for textiles. So, the archaeology is um, patchy in that sense. Sometimes you've got great ideas and but stories such as, you know, the Homeric myths where Penelope's weaving in front of the loom, you know, the, these literary, literary sources give great indications of 
certainly highly idealized um, uh, ways things should work <laughs> and the association with women there. But it would be lovely to know more for, for Britain and Scotland, I do have to say. Thank you so much. I was trying not to be over reliant on Penelope. <laughs> well, yes, Ian, you're right, because it's it's a long way away. And it, it's not just Penelope, there are other references in the literary sources, but yeah, you're quite right in that. And culturally, there were many differences with Britain, and it could have been quite different. And and within Britain, you know, areas of Scotland and England, the, the diversity is likely, I would say. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I'm just gonna have another quick scroll through. Um, there's another one from Leslie there. Is there, is there evidence for a single person processing the flax from collection to producing final product? That for you, Susanna, I think. Oh, do you mean at Must Farm, maybe? Um, yeah, it's hard to, it is really hard to associate people directly with the archaeological finds. So there's a set, it's a settlement site at Must Farm with five preserved um, structures. So some kind of building, uh, round or slightly rectangular. Um, so while individuals are really hard to get to in that sense, um, what's fascinating is that some of those structures have more preserved bundles of fiber than others. And so there's a sense of, of some places having these stashes of fibers, whereas others, there's more of a stash of yarn, for example. So while we don't exactly have what you're asking about, which is the individual harvesting the, the plants, processing them and working with them, we do have a sense of within the community of, I think, different people working with different parts of that process. That's an assumption, of course, based on the distribution that I was just briefly describing of those finds. Um, but yeah, um, I think that's I think that's as far as I can get with that answer. So thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, now there is another question on here. Um, you, you, did you want to say anything? Because as maybe with your yeah. weaving hat on, that you've got experience of working with flax and things. Well, I don't, I don't think that I have nothing to uh, add to Susanna's comments. Thank you. Yeah, there was, there's a question here um, where, and I, I feel I should be able to answer this myself. There's a question here where somebody's asking about the site on Sky. Um, locations won't be disclosed um, for ongoing works at archaeological digs just to protect the location. Um, once the understanding is, once material and reports are produced, more information will come out. Um, somebody was asking there um, where the site in Sky was that you were talking about. So it's just to keep that site protected um, while the work was on, um, on there. But I'm sure if you keep up to date, um, you'll see information shared um, by everyone involved. It's, it's been really fascinating being involved in this project and meeting everyone at the Cayleys. Um, and learning more myself as an archivist. I am, um, Suzanne, I was at the Galloway Horde exhibition in, uh, I saw it in Aberdeen a couple of weeks ago and I was absolutely, I didn't realize that the little, little beaker was covered in material and fibers. Um, yeah. And I just, um, if you're able to, I just wanted to find out a little bit more what that was like. In my head, I was imagining it kind of being gently, kind of carefully wrapped and all these items being preciously stored in the different fibers and materials that were used. Yes, that's quite right. So the gallery hoard is a early medieval hoard. It's on display at the Aberdeen um, Museum at the moment and has 
again, just this very unusual preservation due to the metal ions and the little jar you're talking about, I think the rock crystal jar is wrapped in wonderful intricate textiles that uh, came from the east, exactly where in Central Asia we're, we're working out and yeah, it, and it makes a big difference to have the preserved textiles because it adds to understanding the organic materials. So yeah, so I hope I'm pleased you enjoyed it. I mean, I was absolutely blown away by what Tuja is talking about with the preserved animal fibers. I, mean, I just think this is so radical to understand these ancient sites with the animal populations there and the animal materials. And I just think that's, yeah, again, just remarkable to add the organics into what we understand. Anyone want to come in with any more questions or? The, there's one for two year. Um, oh yeah. Can, can you, the hairs be radiocarbon dated? Is there enough material? Usually there is not enough material because the hairs might be about one millimeter or two millimeter long or even under a millimeter. And the problem in uh, Finland is also the acidic soil and uh, hairs are so thin that they are, the DNA is usually degraded in, in the... No, sorry, I was talking about DNA. Uh, but, but no, they are too small for, for radiocarbon dating. I had some questions and I'd totally forgotten what they were because <laughs> I was thinking about things. Uh, yeah, anyway, I don't know if anybody else has got any other questions. It's this intertwining of all the different, the, the, the different technologies, the different skills and how people approach things as well. Yeah. I'm pulling on different threads of knowledge. Yeah. Um, so I've popped some uh, links in the chat for everyone um, from, sent from Susanna as to some YouTube videos and some publications that you can read and the talk which I'll be watching myself soon on unraveling the Galloway Horde because um, I'm a bit obsessed with medieval times. <laughs> so that's on there for everyone um, and there'll be updates. Um, the video will be shared online and there'll be updates coming. Um, on the next few weeks about Caroline's exhibition and the rest of the work we'll be doing um, alongside that. So I don't know if you want to add anything else about the next steps, Caroline, or are you? Oh, that's a good idea. Um, yes, well, I'm getting work ready for the exhibition at the moment, and the opening will be on the 1st of November, and it'll be on at the Archive Centre for three months or so, and I'm hoping this project will come to the, an end in December, but I'm hoping that maybe the, we'll do a couple of events when the exhibition is on, uh, but we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, I, I have got an Instagram uh, page for it, but I'm not very good at keeping up with all those things. <laughs> so I'll try and I'll try and do that. Yeah. That's great. Um, what I'll do is I'll just end the recording with everyone. Um...